Oh. Um, welcome everybody to our first virtual Brownback seminar of the Center for Southeast European Studies. Um, unlike usually when we have this uh, in live, live in Graz, we're having it, uh, well, so to speak, all over the world or all over Southeastern Europe from Graz to Zagreb. Uh, our first speaker in the Brownback series uh, virtually is Ivan Obadic, who is our uh, visiting fellow in the framework of the uh, dimensions of Europeanization uh, field uh, of excellence. Um, unfortunately, he was able to only be in Graz briefly and he's returned uh, to, uh, he's back in Croatia. He was presenting his presentation uh, from there and he's presenting it and he's working on the relations between Yugoslavia, socialist Yugoslavia, and the European community. So his presentation today is In Pursuit of Stability, Tito's Yugoslavia, and the European Community. So Ivan, I give the floor over to you and uh, looking forward to the presentation. Okay, thank you. Hello to everyone. Um, today I'm going to talk about the origins and evolution of the Yugoslav policy towards the EEC and the Western European integration process uh, overall. Uh, in other words, I'm going to talk about the prehistory of the Western Balkan countries' relations with the European Union. Um, I would like to start my presentation by explaining how I got interested in researching this topic. Uh, I became intrigued about this subject when I was studying the process of Yugoslav disintegration and the Yugoslav in the European engagement in the Yugoslav crisis in 1991. Uh, as you are all aware, um, in mid-1991, European political leaders had enthusiastically decided to assume responsibility for mediating between the conflicting Yugoslav republics. By December 1991, however, the European community suffered a complete failure to mediate a peaceful solution to the Yugoslav crisis and to speak, with, to speak with one voice in the international arena. In other words, the Yugoslav crisis was a missed opportunity for the emerging European Union to establish itself uh, as a powerful international actor. But 1991 also represents a missed opportunity for the former Yugoslav republics to take on the road towards the European integration, with the notable exception of Slovenia. Indeed, after the collapse of the communist regimes and opening of the enlargement perspective for Eastern European countries, Yugoslavia clearly stood out as the most obvious candidate to take the lead in this process, as Belgrade had already established a very close cooperation with the European community. For me, the idea of this missed opportunity was something that intrigued me. But this topic really engaged my interest when I realized how strong institutional ties were established between Yugoslavia, which was a socialist country, and the European community already from the late 1960s. And I wanted to understand what were the underlying reasons for such Yugoslav as well as the European community policy. As my research progressed, I realized that it is impossible to understand the rationale of the Yugoslav relationship with the EEC without closer examination of the early Yugoslav policy towards the broader Western European integration process and the failures of the Yugoslav foreign trade and economic policy. Um, so, uh, besides the basic foreign trade policy cons concepts towards the EEC, I focused on the perceptions of the Western European integration process among the Yugoslav political and economic elite. The questions that guided my research were followed. How did Yugoslav policymakers react to the Western European integration process? What impact did the success of the EC have on Yugoslav foreign policy and internal differences among the political elite? In what way did the, Yugo the League of Communists of Yugoslavia rationalize their co cooperation with the EC? What did it mean for the internal co coherence of the Communist Party and for Yugoslavia's pronounced cooperation with the developing countries? How did the relationship between the EEC and Yugoslavia transform in the 1970s and 1980s? But the overarching question is how and why the EEC already in the 1960s became such an important external actor, factor, crucial for the economic development and stability of Yugoslavia? Yugoslavia. Uh, no. So the structure, in order to address these questions, uh, I have divided my presenta presentation in four parts and built them upon following points at issue. First, how did Yugoslav authorities formulate their views and policies towards the early Western European integration process? Second, why did their position, position change until the mid 1960s? Third, how did Belgrade manage to achieve an arrangement with the most important trading bloc, the EC? And finally, the evolution of the relationship between the EC and Yugoslavia in the 1970s. Uh, so first, uh, uh, sorry, 
I would uh, like to give a brief overview of the development of the relationship between Yugoslavia and Western European integration projects in the 1950s. The radical foreign policy changes in the early period of the Cold War had a decisive impact on Yugoslav visions of and policies towards European integration. In 1948, when the post-war European integration process began with the European Recovery Plan, Yugoslavia was, as the most ardent Soviet ally, an unlikely candidate among Eastern European countries to advance relations with Western European organizations. Indeed, Belgrade's initial reactions to the European project were highly critical, but as Yugoslavia's position dramatically changed following the break with the Soviet Union, and as Yugoslavia was becoming increasingly dependent on the Western powers, Bel Belgrade's attitude towards Western European integration began to alter. The deepening of relations with the Western powers opened the question of Yugoslav integration into the Western, Western European military, economic, and political structures. Yugoslav policies towards, towards Western European integration in this period were based on the promotion of the broadest and most universal cooperation possible. Yugoslavia, in particular, wanted, wanted to avoid any loss of sovereignty and therefore insisted on special arrangements. Such Yugoslav policies corresponded with the country's international standing and its interest in trade with Western Europe. The failed attempt in 1955-1956 to establish closer relations with the Council of Europe, however, ended Yugoslav ambitions to pursue a more pro-European policy. More importantly, the failure of the Western Europe countries to construct an independent third force in the post-war international order by the mid-1950s substantially influenced Yugoslav foreign policy orientation in the Cold War because its international position depended on the free coordinated relationship with the United States, the Soviet Union, and developing Afro-Asian countries. So, uh, while Western Europe did not play such a prominent political role in Yugoslav foreign policy, from the mid-1950s, Yugoslavia became increasing, increasingly economically dependent on the Western European countries, mostly Italy and Germany. In spite of this, the Yugoslav attitude towards Western European economic organizations until the late 1950s was indifferent, defined by strong domestic economic growth, the pursuit of too ambitious worldwide, worldwide commercial strategy aiming to strengthen the economic independence of the country, but which was well beyond the Yugoslav economic and financial capacities and the relatively limited progress of Western European integration. In addition, from the mid-1950s, Yugoslavia established limited cooperation with the OEC and thereby protected its economic interest in Europe. Yugoslav cooperation with the OEC, however, became less important as a result of the emergence of the EEC and EFTA. Now, uh, the emergence of the EEC in 1957, soon followed by the British plans for a free trade area and the creation of EFTA in 1959, raised concerns among Yugoslav policymakers about the future prospects on key foreign markets as they, as they understood that the regional, regionalization of European trade would discriminate against imports coming from third countries with adverse consequences for the Yugoslav economy as well. Therefore, their chief concern was to ensure that the deepening of Western European integration could not hurt Yugoslav trade with Western European countries. This was even more important because, from the mid-1950s onwards, Yugoslavia could no longer expect, expect substantial Western financial aid. Instead, the Western powers continued to support Yugoslavia financially through credits. As a result, the deficit of the balance of payments developed into the central problem of Yugoslav economic and foreign trade policy. In this context, the most important aim of the Belgian government became ensuring the long-term stability of its trading relations with Western European countries. Since the limits of Yugoslav cooperation with the Western European economic organizations were already defined within the framework of the association with the OEC, and with uncertainty surrounding the outcome of the whole process and the potential impact for Yugoslavia, the Yugoslav establishment was becoming increasingly aware, aware that they had to pursue alternative policies in order to broaden and expand the economic relations with Western Europe and to find the most appropriate way how to integrate into the emerging Western European multilateral trading system. Now, it is important to emph emphasize that the, that the adverse reaction to the EEC was not only based on economic arguments, but also reflected broader ideological considerations. In the late 1950s and early 1960s, 
a wider debate took place within the Belgrade establishment concerning the country position in the, interna inter 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 in the international economic order, within which Yugoslav political leaders and terrorists had articulated concrete positions and ideological views on the Western European and the economic integration process. They began to recognize the problem of regional integration alongside the socialist world market and the position of the underdeveloped countries in the international economy as one of the three main challenges of, for the world economy. <clears throat> now, the Yugoslav ideological position towards regional and global economic integration was actually made public in a new liberal party program in 1958 in regard to regional economic integration and international intergovernmental organizations. The program characterized them as a new instrument of developed countries for achieving economic and political hegemony over the underdeveloped and developing nations. This viewpoint was then elaborated in much more detail, most notably by Janis Stanovnik, who was director of the Belgrade Institute of International Politics and Economy. Stanovnik and his associates conceived a new theory of foreign trade, the policy of economic coexistence, which implied various aspects of economic cooperation among the developing countries and diversification of the Yugoslav foreign trade by focusing on trade with these countries. They argued that, argued that Western European economic integration and the EEC in particular was a process of coordination of Western European national economic policies in an effort to internationalize, quote, state capitalism, in, end of quote. Instead of advancing the integration of the world economy, this process was in fact, in fact further disintegrating the world economy in the narrow interest of the Western European countries. The ideological point of view on the EEC had significant implications on the strategic focus of Yugoslav foreign economic policy. Stanovnik argued that political cooperation with an organization that was an ideological and economic adversary was unsustainable. Instead, Yugoslavia should establish cooperation with other countries that were negatively impacted by EEC policies and should particularly aim to cooperate with the developing countries. The main objective of this cooperation would be the integration of the world economy and opposition against the discriminatory policies of the EEC. Such an ideological and foreign trade platform was rebuffed by several economists, most notably by Croatian economist Vladimir Pertov and Rudolf Bicenic. Bicenic made the strongest argument in favor of the Western European orientation of the Yugoslav foreign economic policy and the need to urgently address the question of Yugoslav EEC relations. He criticized Yugoslav orientation towards closer cooperation with the developing countries. Any integration of the Yugoslav economy with the global south was in his view unsustainable, and therefore he emphasized that Yugoslavia had a long-standing interest in the integration of Western Europe. For this reason, Bicenic argued that Yugoslavia should find some flexible forms of cooperation with the EEC. These opposing points of view over the Yugoslav policy towards the EEC reflected a wider fissure within the Yugoslav establishment on the question of foreign economic policy. On the one side, the desire of the party leadership to pursue economic cooperation with the third world countries, which corresponded to their ideological views and political interests. On the other, the belief in the foreign trade and expert circles that Yugoslav economic interests lie in closer ties with Europe. <clears throat> Uh, so, now uh, to say something about the Yugoslavia at the crossroads. So this was the period between 1962 and 1964. Uh, in the end, uh, in 1961-1962, the combination of international and internal developments and straightforward economic pressures prompted a reprisal of the Yugoslav policy towards the EEC. First and foremost, top Yugoslav policymakers were surprised by the, by the success of the EEC. In a short period, integration spurred extraordinary economic growth among the EEC member states, which exceeded the Belgrade authorities' expectations. The faster than expected advance towards an industrial custom union and a common commercial policy, conjointly with setting up the basic design of the common agriculture policy, marked the emergence of the EEC as the world's largest trading bloc. The impressive accomplishments of the EEC initial phase changed the way in which Yugoslav policymakers perceived the community. The success of the EEC indicated that the drive for greater political, economic, and institutional integration, which was at that point being discussed among the six, was likely to be completed. But the crucial moment, 
that had an enormous impact on the reformulation of the Yugoslav policy towards the EC was the British government decision announced in mid-1961 to apply for membership of the EEC. Britain's EEC application made the Yugoslav international economic position even more vulnerable, especially as it impelled other Western European countries to re-evaluate their policies towards the six. Along with the emergence of a major protectionist trading bloc in Western Europe with a highly protective cap, uh, in 1961-1962, the U.S.-Yugoslav relations substantially deteriorated to their lowest point since 1948. Yugoslavia's worsening international economic position coincided with the first serious economic crisis in 19, since 1952. After a decade of high eco economic growth, the 1961 economic crisis has taken the Yugoslav authorities and economists by surprise. The crisis revealed the structural imbalances of the Yugoslav economy, which were mainly the result of the extensive growth strategy. A mounting balance of payment deficit and foreign debt indicated the economic vulnerability. Furthermore, the Yugoslav economy became heavily dependent on imported, dominantly Western European machinery, components, semi-finished goods, and some raw materials. Such a highly import-dependent industrial structure resulted in a further worsening of the external imbalance of the Yugoslav economy. The issue of external economic instability, which has already in the late 1950s became a fundamental economic problem, has now evolved into a present political question. The economic and political crisis had two aspects which, had, which were deeply interlinked. Internally, the crisis had further emphasized the growing differences, differences within the Yugoslav leadership over the future direction of the country's society, political system, and economy. Externally, as the economy deteriorated, Yugoslavia's international position became more and more difficult, especially the impending increase in foreign debt payments to the West added to the strain on the balance of payments and thus made Yugoslav policies uh, unintelligible. As the main sources of external financing, which covered the balance of payments deficit, and financed Yugoslavia's ambitious investment program came from Western Europe and the US, the increasing uncertainty about the continuation of the US financial support as well as the access to the common market had once again put foreign trade relations at the center of economic policy. Policy towards Western Europe and the EEC was one of the focal points in this debate. Now, on this table, you can see the debt service payments shape schedule in millions of euro uh, dollars, uh, and you can see how much they owe to the EC uh, countries. So uh, the Yugoslav position towards the EC was the first, for the first time discussed at the highest political level at the meeting of enlarged party executive committee in March 1962. Tito convened the meeting of the top party and government officials to discuss the economic crisis and political differences, differences within the Yugoslav leadership. By early 1962, the polarization of the political establishment became evident. On the one side, liberals were pressing for further democratization and decentralization of the economic and political system, while on the other side, the conservatives favored a centralist, Soviet-style economic and political system. Three-day party meeting for the first time openly revealed the fundamental differences between the two party factions. Although the party meeting did not resolve the internal party factionalism over key issues of the economic and political system, at the end of the meeting, the leadership agreed on the necess necessity to protect Yugoslav economic interests and trade with the EEC. A basic aim was to improve the country country's balance of payments position by increasing exports and reducing non-essential imports. But policymakers were aware that Yugoslavia would have to find some modus vivendi with the EEC. For this reason, the government ad adopted a comprehensive multi-level diplomatic strategy with the primary aim to secure the best possible access to the common market. As a first step, at the bilateral level, Yugoslavia was keen to establish closer cooperation with European neutral countries in order to expand mutual economic cooperation and promote, promote their common economic interests vis-a-vis -vis the EC. The government also decided to explore, explore ways to improve, improve bilateral economic arrangements with France and Italy, which would reduce the EC barriers to trade. At the multilateral level, Yugoslavia decided to much more actively condemn the discriminatory measures of the EC within the OECD and GATT. Simultaneously with these efforts by the Minister of Foreign Affairs, Tito centered his activities on expanding, expanding economic relations with the Soviet Union and third world countries. 
the onset of the of the yet another Yugoslav Soviet rapprochement in the early 1960s paved the way for the expansion of economic cooperation. It also offered an opportunity for Yugoslavia to address its unfavorable position in relation to the EC. Another major Yugoslav policy initiative in the international arena, which had a pronounced political and economic dimension, was directed towards third world countries. Even before the Yugoslav government formulated a coherent strategy towards the EEC, Tito seized the moment at the Belgrade conference to promote the idea of convening an international economic conference to discuss the most pressing issues facing the world economy and problems of underdeveloped countries. The struggle against discriminatory regional blocs, especially the EEC, was a central part of Tito's initiative. The Yugoslav leader considered that the non-aligned countries could more easily face the difficulties and discriminatory policies of the developed Western nations if they acted together against such tendency. The Cairo Conference on the Problems of the Economic Development, which took place in July 1962, marked the culmination of many months of Yugoslav activity among the third world countries directed against the EEC. Indeed, until mid-1962, Yugoslavia was one of the first, fiercest critics of the EEC discriminatory trade policies in international politics. However, the strategy designed by the Yugoslav authorities failed to address the underlying problems of trade caused by the, caused by the creation of the EEC until mid-1962. Belgrade's actions, even though they increased the visibility of the Yugoslav problem with the EEC, also caused considerable disaffection in the Western capitals. Washington policymakers were considerably concerned about the effects of Yugoslav policies on Western relations with the non-aligned countries. The Commission and the EEC member states were, were also critical of the Yugoslav actions and the possible outcomes of the Cairo conference. And while the Yugoslav policy encountered criticism from the West, it did not secure any benefit in the trade with the EEC. The Yugoslav Minister of Foreign Affairs therefore strongly argued for establishing direct contacts with the EEC. But formal proposal to the Commission in October 1962 to open technical exploratory talks was met with the West German opposition, which was linked to the Hausstein Doctrine. Apart from the Council decision, other factors also played a role in the Yugoslav decision not to press for further contacts with the EEC. First, the Yugoslav economy began to recover in the second half of 1962. At the same time, the most important Yugoslav export products to the common market, beef, was still not subject to the CAP regulations. Finally, the goals veto on British membership of the EEC in 1963, thwarted the emergence of a unified Western European trading bloc, and triggered the community's first major crisis. Without the immediate risk of economic isolation for Western Europe, with the German opposition to the Yugoslav EEC trade consultations, and no clear picture of the short-term economic impact of the common market and Yugoslav foreign trade, while the, at the same time relations with the Soviet Union were getting increasingly warmer, Yugoslav authorities adopted a wait-and-see attitude towards the EEC. Instead of pursuing contacts with the community, under the new circumstances, the Yugoslav foreign policy establishment decided to take advantage of the Western European division over the issue of British membership in order to find solution to Yugoslav trade problems. In the following period, the government pressed for bilateral trade deals with Italy, West Germany, and France. Yugoslav diplomacy also aimed its attention at the first session of the UNCTAD as an inter international forum in which Yugoslavia could promote its inter interest in international trade and decided to take part in the Kennedy round. Um, Yugoslavia's problem with the common market and the deterioration of political and economic relations with the Western powers due to its anti-colonial and anti-Western policies, together with the Soviet Yugoslav Japan, opened the question of the country's international position in the early 1960s. Challenges to Yugoslavia's trade with the EEC were only one of the causes of change in foreign policy. Their approachment with the Soviet Union and opposing visions of Yugoslav socialism had sharpened the emerging divisions over foreign policy within the country's political and foreign policy establishment. The conservative pro-Rankovic group in the party advocated closer cooperation with the Soviet Union. Liberally minded politicians, on the other hand, championed better relations with the Western European countries and the US, as they considered their support crucial for the development of the Yugoslav economy and stability of the country. After the party meeting in March 1962, the conservative faction, now supported by Tito, had taken the reins of the party. Kader, the strongest proponent of decentralization and debureaucratization of the economic and political system, was marginalized. The conservative ascendancy within the party underlined the difference between the party and foreign ministry regarding the country's foreign policy orientation. 
As a result, two parallel strikes of Yugoslav foreign policy were now being formed. The so-called Sipovska linea of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and the party line which was openly pro-Soviet. Kocha Popovic, the longest serving use of foreign minister, always remained suspicious of so Moscow's intentions and insisted on the strict policy of equidistance between the West and East. The cementing of closer Yugoslav relations with Moscow, therefore, further intensified the struggle between the minister on the one side and Tito, Rankovic, and, um, and the party on the other side. Hence, the position of the minister and Popovic was difficult in this period, not only because they were suspected of being pro-Western, the ministry was seeking to protect the country's interest in Western Europe, since by and large Yugoslav diplomats believed that these countries were crucial for stability and prosperity of Yugoslav economy. Now, these relations were threatened by the Yugoslav Soviet rapprochement and the emergence of the EEC. Tito's support played a crucial role in the struggle between the conservative faction of the party and the ministry regarding foreign policy orientation, and between the liberal and conservative factions within the party. Although, although Tito grew closer to the conservative faction, in the course of 1963, he began to gradually endorse the liberal faction. From mid-1963, external and economic factors played an increasing part in Tito's decision to support the liberal faction. But what won Tito over, the, over to the reformist side and ended his balancing between the conservative and liberal factions was growing economic troubles, which became apparent in 1964. The economic difficulties in the early 1960s opened a heated debate over the question of the optimal model of economic growth and development. The debate had high political importance since it determined the evolution of the country's political and economic system. The strategy of balanced economic development and how to enhance economic performance lie at the heart of this debate. The debate culminated in 1963 the main, the main argument of the liberals was that the Yugoslavia had reached a high level of economic development. So the economic policies should now be focused on the productivity intensive growth. In their view, the autarkic economic development based on high investment and labor input was responsible for severe and deepening economic problems. These disproportions in the functioning, functioning of the economy indicated a structural instability of the economic system. The negative side effects of the Yugoslav development strategy were, more, were most clearly expressed in fundamental external disequilibrium. Therefore, liberals were pressing for a comprehensive reform of the economic system in order to achieve internal and external balance in the economy. Their policies were based on increasing the economic efficiency by strengthening the market mechanism and on export-oriented strategy as an important engine of import economic growth. Indeed, in their economic model, foreign trade played a central role in achieving macroeconomic stability and spurring productivity and economic growth. The protracted deadlock over the economic policy ended in 1964 with the intensification of economic instability. The, diffi the difficult economic situation was further aggravated by the inadequ inadequacies of the Gustav foreign trade strategy. The widening and diversification of foreign trade relations, which aimed to reduce the country's dependence on trade with the West and to address the discriminatory nature of the European integration, integration process, created immense economic tensions. The, rel the relative increase of Yugoslavia's trade with third world countries did not substantially lessen the importance of Western Europe for Yugoslav trade. In fact, in fact, in the second half of the 1960s, Yugoslav trade relations with the third world and common economy stagnated while trade with the EEC increased. There were a number of reasons for this decline. Trade with the socialist bloc was characterized by a strict bilateral clearing system that had an adverse impact on the growth and of trade relations. This administrative system constrained Yugoslav exports to the socialist countries, despite growing demand for Yugoslav products. In contrast, Yugoslavia had limited interest in importing products from these countries for a number of reasons, not least low quality, terms of trade, etc. Similarly, Trade with third world countries was negatively influenced by the uncompetitiveness of Yugoslav products and undermined by the lack of adequate credit facilities and efficient trading networks, both essential to accessing emerging market. The structural problem of Yugoslav regional foreign trade further aggravated the balance of payments deficit. The clearing system with the socialist countries did not provide Yugoslavia with much needed convertible currency, while trade with the third world countries largely relied on Yugoslav credits. 
At the same time, Yugoslavia's import-dependent industry relied high, heavily on Western technology and therefore convertible currency was increasingly needed to finance in export and development. Moreover, Yugoslav debts to the West continued to rise, placing additional pressure on the balance of payments deficit. Thus, in order to overcome these difficulties and to avoid the debt trap, Yugoslavia had to increase its export to Western markets, particularly with its major trading partner, the EEC member countries. Now, here you can see Yugoslav balance of trade by region in 1961, uh, where you can see that it had a massive balance of trade deficit with convertible currency area. That means with the Western countries, while <coughs> it had surplus with clearing currency area. Another table shows the, the volume, the range of the Yugoslav credits to developing countries in, in only five years. So because of the lack of financial means, Yugoslavia actually had to finance it or, or, or to, uh, to finance uh, its trade with the third world countries, which also put additional pressure on the, on the uh, balance of payments deficit. Uh, and finally, this is the structure of Yugoslav foreign debt in 1967, where we can see that Yugoslav debt to the total debt to the convertible currency area amounted to 90, almost 95% of, uh, of the foreign debt. So uh, eventually, uh, in 1964, the liberals with the support of Tito managed to init initiate market-oriented reform of the economic system. The transformation of the economy from a closed to an open one had significant economic, political, and social repercussions. The reform marked the beginning of a period of greater liberalization and even democratization of the society and political system with the aim to stabilize, stabilize Yugoslavia politically. In the economic sphere, the reform had to dynamize the economy by increasing its productivity, advancing modernization of the industry, and promoting exports in order to stabilize the external balance and secure sustainable economic growth. By introducing stu structural challenges to the economic system in order to secure more balanced economic growth and development, the Yugoslav leadership wanted to stabilize the economic as well as the political system since economic problems were intensifying internal tensions. The reform was focused on three main areas, one of which was foreign trade. Indeed, to achieve the goals of the economic reform, it was necessary to open Yugoslavia to Western Europe in order to modernize the economy and achieve greater efficiency. The reform brought Yugoslavia much closer to the European community's economic sphere in several ways. First, the liberalization of trade led to a significant increase of imports from the community. Second, in order to attract capital investments and acquire new technologies, equipment, and know-how, Yugoslavia became the first communist country to allow private foreign investments. The majority of the joint venture agreements with foreign companies were signed with companies from EEC countries. Third, the reform underlined the importance of tourism for the Yugoslav economy. In the 1960s, tourism revenues became an increasingly important source of convertible currency and an efficient way to reduce the balance of payment deficit. Tourists came mostly from Western European countries, a factor that would play an important role in the relations with the EEC in the later periods. Moreover, there was one even greater source of invisible transactions coming from the EEC member states, the remittance from the Yugoslav migrants workers abroad. Policymakers realized that the economic reform would raise unemployment and therefore decided to permit economic migration to the West. This was implemented not only to ease the problem of unemployment, but also to increase the country's invisible earnings and hopefully contribute to the industrial and economic cooperation with the host countries. Here on table five, you can see the worker remittance and receipts from tourism from 1970 to 1978. Uh, so after the first, uh, um, uh, after the first unsuccessful attempt by Yugoslavia to open discussions with the Commission, um, uh, about the consequences of community policies and Yugoslav trade relations with the member states in 1962, by the mid-1960s, the circumstances for beginning preliminary talks with the EEC seemed more promising. Most EEC member states in bilateral, bilateral contact were open to the, to the Yugoslav initiative. In addition, Yugoslavia had strong support from its most important trading partner, Italy. Furthermore, Belgrade considered that the community had a political and economic interest to accept the Yugoslav initiative. Indeed, in the second half of the 1960s, there were a favorable set of conditions for the establishment of direct 
because of EC relations as a result of the full development of the plan, the EC engagement in East-West relations, and further deepening of the EC from 1969. Still, negotiation, nego negotiating the first trade agreement proved to be a formidable issue. Only the Soviet intervention in Czechoslovakia unlocked the impasse as it fed Western concerns about a possible similar threat to Yugoslavia. After that, EC relations with Yugoslavia, a once per peripheral issue in the community debate, topped the community external agenda. The new situation, in which Cold War considerations played an important role, opened the road to, for Yugoslavia to negotiate the trade agreement and secure a more favorable treatment from the community, which was signed in March, in March 97. The Yugoslav EC trade agreement was actually the first arrangement that the community has signed after the common trade policy has entered into force in 1970. Thus, the, pro the, the prospect of Yugoslav cooperation and trade with the community appeared to be promising in the early 1970s. However, development, the development of these relations in the 1970s ultimately proved, proved to be much more difficult and troubling for Yugoslavia. Um, I would stop here because uh, I think I have used my time and I could take questions. Thank you so, thank you so much, Ivan. Um, mm -hmm. This is when you would normally hear applause or knocking on tables, but unfortunately in, <laughs> our, in our virtual world, we don't do that. Thank you so much for giving us uh, this uh, uh, kind of insight into Yugoslav, I guess, EC relations at their early stages. So uh, when they became much more intense, of course, in the 1980s then eventually, mm -hmm. um, but kind of the, the history of it. So I would open the floor to uh, questions. So if you have any of you have any questions, please use the, um, raise your hand uh, option or alternatively um, uh, mention it on chat. Um, I would, I mean, I would maybe um, start by, by asking you a question uh, while waiting for others to, to uh, get the virtual courage. Um, to, to which degree, because um, you've traced the domestic considerations mostly in Yugoslavia, how um, uh, the um, the, the, the struggle, the power struggle inside Yugoslavia shaped relations to the European community at the time. To which degree was, how was the European community side viewing Yugoslavia as a, part, as a partner at that particular moment? Mm -hmm. Was it seeing it as a, uh, again, a potential, you know, a, an imaginable member state, like it did Turkey at least at some point? Uh, or was it, uh, was it, you know, kind of, was it much more considered than the, the geopolitical, uh, you know, uh, Cold War logic where you could have ties, but a membership for Yugoslavia was hardly imaginable? So how, how is this with the European community side of the story? Well, uh, there was readiness on the European Commission side to establish relations with Yugoslavia or to enter into at least uh, exploratory talks and negotiations about the trading arrangements much, much sooner. Uh, the problem was the position of the member states, especially the position of Germany. The Hallstein Doctrine indeed um, proved as a formidable obstacle to uh, establishing formal relations between Yugoslavia and the EEC from 1962 onwards. Uh, and it remained so until the second half of the, until 1966-97, when the relations with the West Germany and Yugoslavia uh, were normalized. Um, but also uh, the relations with the community were also troubled with problematic relations with other, me other, me other member states of the European community at certain, at, at certain uh, period. For example, with France and Belgium in 1961, 1962, with France and even earlier from the late 1950s. And it Italy was actually the, with the Commission, was the most strongest proponent, proponent within the European community that Yugoslavia should be granted some kind of trading arrangement. Uh, and then, ironically, in 1967, because of one, one quite complex story, Italy was the one member country which actually blocked Yugoslav entrance within the European community. Uh, not, not, not entrance, but the establishment of the trading uh, arrangements. Uh, while Germany became the main proponent, proponent of, the, of the Yugoslav, uh, uh, of, of, of 
to establish Yugoslav relations, uh, is to establish community relations with Yugoslavia. With Yugoslavia. Of course, the 1968 changed everything, and the Cold War considerations, which were always there, now indeed ch profoundly changed the community policy toward Yugoslavia. And then another very important aspect, and I didn't manage to go in the 1970s or even 1980s because I just wanted to clarify how did this. Uh, how, how did how did the Yugoslav position uh, evolve towards the European community? But what was from the community side an important change was the realization of the fragility of, of Yugoslavia, internal fragility of Yugoslavia, or how internal fragile is Yugoslavia um, following the Croatian Spring, so from the early 1970s, and they realized that they have to support Yugoslavia economically and financially in order to um, preserve the stability of the country and also to pull Yugoslavia into the Western, into the Western, uh, towards the Western Europe. Mm -hmm. um, I hope I, I was... Yes, thank you, thank you. Um, another question I, I would have is, I mean, to which degree did the, um, or did you, could, could you observe that the, um, the end of dictatorships in Spain, Portugal, and Greece in the early 70s. I mean, they all happened within uh, a few years, um, 74 to 76, roughly. To which degree did that change the, the kind of overall dynamic? Because I mean, of the, these th three countries were, of course, not part of the European economic community. They could not join because they were military dictatorships or, or some kind of proto-fascist uh, states. Um, so the question is, to which degree did that, and then, you know, if you think about Greece, of course, that was, was a, a country, neighboring country of, of Yugoslavia, but also then the others were in a certain way, the similar developmental uh, understanding of, from the EC perspective. Did that change anything in the larger dynamic for Yugoslavia or, or what were those in a certain way, because they were not part of, they were part of the quote unquote Western bloc, uh, despite their authoritarian rule, did that matter less in this uh, dynamics between the EC and Yugoslavia? Well, y Yugoslavia was uh, the buffer state and um, actually, uh, there, I mean, it is written about this and Professor Varsori, I think, Varsori, I believe he was the first who has written about the EC policy towards Southern Europe. And this definitely did play a role in, in, in formulation of the community policies towards Yugoslavia as well. Actually, after the period of the 1960s, the 1969 Hague uh, summit and the deepening and widening of the, um, of the European community, uh, the establishment of um, cooperation in the foreign uh, policy between the member states uh, also played a role in the formulation of the European community policies towards Yugoslavia to a certain degree, of course. Mm -hmm. Thanks. So now I would like to get uh, one of our audience members to uh, uh, ask questions. So I haven't had any questions yet, but please do feel free to. Uh, not be shy and ask something. Um, um, aha. Yes, um, we have Zaira uh, mm -hmm. who is asking a question and I'll read it to her because apparently she wrote it on chat, but maybe she would like to ask it in person so we, we can hear her. Um, so <laughs> it would be nice. It would be nice indeed. Um, Zaira, can you hear us? Can, yeah. Do you want to ask your question in person? Hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, yes. I'm Zaira uh, Lofranco. I was um, uh, also a fellow um, in in Graz in the previous semester. Uh, I'm also working on something related, but in contemporary times. So uh, my question is uh, um, related to um, foreign uh, investment. Uh, you mentioned that at one point Yugoslavia allowed foreign investment. Uh, so uh, I had curiosity, are we talking about foreign direct investments in Yugoslavia? And uh, if you can uh, tell us uh, something more um, about uh, um, economic sector towards which this uh, investment were flowing. If you, um, if you, res mm. your research covers also this part. I don't know. 
that's my question. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Zara. Thank you for the question. Um, uh, I'm actually talking about the joint ventures. Uh, the Yugoslav, Yugoslavia, I believe it was the first communist country which actually allowed uh, to the Western companies to directly invest uh, via joint ventures, which were, um, it started in 1968, uh, 1969. It was direct repercussion of the economic reform and the whole concept of the economic reform. And mostly these uh, joint ventures or investors come, came from EC member countries, Germany come especially from Germany. Um, and uh, this is also uh, later also, I would, I would argue that it was um, the idea from the community side also in the 1980s definitely was that Yugoslavia also had a political, uh, a political um, goodwill in the third world countries. So they also considered that they could use Yugoslav good political standing in the third world countries in order to uh, sell their uh, industrial products there as well via the, uh, these joint ventures. But later in the 1970s, there were some changes regarding the law uh, about the joint ventures. And so it was, uh, it, it, it was changing, but that was only in the second half. Or, or in the late 1970s. Uh, but this was the idea how to attract um, know-how and how to attract the uh, transfer of technology from West to Yugoslavia. I think it was the, also the question from Zara about the sectors, which sectors were those uh, joint ventures mostly? Uh, uh, I must say I did not, I did not uh, make this analysis um, about the sectors. Um, I, I have read about it, but I did not pay attention to this. I could not now precisely answer the question. I know I know about some specific cases, but but um, yeah, I, I, I cannot I, answer this question. Yeah, I, I guess car industry, of course, is one of them, uh, which of is course, the, the most well-known one. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes. Thank you. Do we have any other questions uh, from our listeners uh, which you would like to ask? It would be a chance to have one more or two more questions that would be quite useful. Um, anybody else? Um, to which degree, uh, if I'm waiting for people to be courageous, um, uh, okay. it's quite okay to be uh, to say something online, but uh, maybe not everybody is equally comfortable. Um, uh, how do you balance, I mean, because a lot of, in the kind of conventional narratives, it's very much the focus that the U.S. is the main, you know, certain way, provider of loans and supporting Yugoslavia and the Cold mm -hmm. War logic. But I think if you, if you look at the, um, if you look at the, 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 the loans and the, the data you have provided, as far as I could see briefly, it seems that actually the EC countries are at least as significant as the United States is in this equation. So uh, is that just that they were acting, you know, is that like under the logic of NATO framework or, you know, the, or, or, or is there other elements as well which explain that? Uh, and also which, I mean, you mentioned the Hallstein Doctrine and that Germany, of course, didn't have full diplomatic relations with Yugoslavia until the early 70s, as far as I remember. Um, mm -hmm. But it's like 1960s. Uh, late 60s, okay. Uh, yeah. Um, but but that it still had it still had economic ties and you know so in certain way it did have certain types of, of ties irrespective of, of that so so if you could just reflect on that briefly that would be mm -hmm. good. Uh, so um, yeah I, I found so I, I in, in in the archives I, when I was going through these data I did found so it's it's a table from the federal government from the early, I think it's from 1962 or 1963. But actually, I think that uh, Western European countries became almost the same or even larger financial uh, contributor. Or they financed more Yugoslavia than the United States. <coughs> but <coughs> uh, the United States always remained until the end of Yugoslavia, the collapse of Yugoslavia a very important uh, financer for Yugoslavia, uh, which was vital for, for the economic development and stability, economic stability and political stability of the country. But the thing is that um, the US played much more 
important role in foreign trade only until mid 1950s. And then the Western European countries became, uh, when we are talking about the foreign trade, the most impar important economic partner in the West of, of uh, the Yugoslav, uh, the most and more important Yugoslav economic partner in the West, and not the US. The US was important as, as uh, because it was financing Yugoslav, uh, Yugoslavia. It was giving it still some financial aid and more. It was giving loans, but <clears throat> but when we talk about foreign trade, then uh, Germany and Italy were the most important Yugoslav trading partners and I did not I, I, I just didn't have time and there was uh, there's uh, of course much more which I could say but I just wanted to emphasize that there were much more discussions within the Yugo, between the Yugoslav economists politicians regarding the this model of, of, of uh, when they were discussing for example economic reform the foreign trade uh, model, how to change it, how to reform it, uh, what will be the original um, regional, uh, pattern of the Yugoslav foreign trade. And, and, and this is one of, I would say, key issues uh, when we talk about uh, Yugoslav relations, not only with the EEC, but let's say globally uh, in economic terms. Yugoslavia always tried to balance its position uh, re towards regional trading gruppations or blocks, so Eastern, Western, or, or non-aligned. Uh, and it did try to actually, uh, let's say, uh, lessen its dependence on the, on the Western countries by increasing its trade with uh, third world countries. But this uh, this uh, attempt of the economic, let's say, economic non-alignment uh, policy, or this attempt to address the non-alignment non position of Yugoslavia in the international order in the economic sphere, created uh, really uh, immense financial problems for Yugoslavia. And the main problem was that it was technologically dependent on the West, and it had to buy um, raw materials and, and the technology in the West, and it was by paying it by hard currency. While its trade with the third world countries or non-aligned non -aligned countries and the Eastern Bloc never provided Yugoslavia with this hard currency. And that was the reason which really um, make a huge pressure on the balance of payments and contributed to the um, many economic problems especially later in, in the early 1980s well thank you um, we have no further questions so I will wrap it up with this so um, thank you Ivan so much for giving us this presentation and also doing this uh, in this non in, an, in, a, in a format which is not usually what we how we talk or have conversations so I'm, I'm very glad and I'm grateful that you were willing to do so so thank you so much for sharing your thoughts with us and thank all of you uh, who participated in today's session